<laughs> you want people. Yeah. Nobody knows you. <laughs> Hi, John Harris. This is uh, this is an honor. Um, I know. I know you as a man manager, a booking agent. I know you as a buyer. I know you as the Millennium Music Conference guy. You, uh, your your story is very wide. All things music business kind of stuff. You had your hands in the too many jobs to tell, to write well, down. That's correct. But tried you everything. Gotta, you got to remember that when I started, they didn't have specific things. One person did it all anyway. Yeah, and now we're back to that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Full so, circle. Pendulum swings. Pendulum swings. So how'd you get your start in, in the music business? Or even go even before that, what, what music? Oh, well, I... Take music I, back to your childhood. I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs. Okay. Um, and, um, I mean, ever, I had sisters. So I can remember coming home from school and then being in the living room dancing to American Bandstand. Mm -hmm. And I just remember music at an early age and growing up in Philadelphia, uh, you know, then radio was big, you know, so yeah. I could listen to any of the radio stations, you know, for whatever kind of music. I mean, I suppose, you know, I came alive, you know, when music was used for protest, political protest. Yes. Not counting the British wave, but, you know, folk yeah. music, 60s, you know, mm -hmm. stuff. and of course it progressed. But um, I can remember in high school producing events, um, legendary mixers at my high school. Okay. Being on the social committee and producing events. And I even did some... Uh, Although it wasn't a theater buff or anything like that, we produced some things. Uh -huh. So it was in my blood to produce. So them. you've been doing this since you were like a teenager? More than likely, I guess. Yeah. Like organizing, organizing parties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Did you yeah. ever play music? No, I can't sing or dance. Okay, you know? okay. <laughs> I mean, I have. You know, in college, I used to jam with people on the guitar, but I never got past, you know, rhythm. Okay. All right. All right. Back, background on a couple of Martini Brothers songs, you know. All right. All right. Background vocals. It know. helps to know them. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I've always been the organizer and the yeah. promoter or the whatever. Yeah. So, so in uh, high school, you, you graduate from high school, then, uh, then what happens? Well, and I went to college like everyone else, and that's where I learned to drink and fight. Yeah. Play soccer. Yeah. Be in, you know, be in social activities, you know, but, uh, you know, even in college, I think I helped organize concerts and events and, you know, stuff. I mean, I came out of college not expecting to do anything like that. Okay. I took, um, uh, political patronage jobs that I had connections with the then governor. Okay. That's why I came to Harrisburg. And I went to grad school, coached soccer, played soccer. And, um, you know, really didn't like that either. And I guess it was a chance meeting with a cocktail waitress in grad school. I ended up at a nightclub one night because she was going to be late for work and I was driving. And next thing you know, Couple months later, I'm running a nightclub. You're, you're what? Uh, it was a place called the Creekside Inn. Okay, you I'm owned sure it, how, but I was I was manager of the Creekside Inn. Okay, my first year, year or two out of college. You know? All right. With it, this is where Mechanicsburg. Okay. Uh, it still burned down and flooded, but uh, it was open seven nights a week. It was a restaurant, but we did bands five nights a week. Who were some of the bands that you uh, that you hired back then? Well, back then they were all the cover bands. They used to have a circuit that was in hotels and nightclubs where bands would go and they would stay for four nights, sometimes five nights. Okay. And they were usually the cover bands. So I can remember booking Hit and Run and Trust and 
I mean, there were so many bands for this is going back, you know, to yeah. the, what I would say would be mid to late 70s. Okay. That's how old my ass is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I um, hit and run. I played with Steve Lentz. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yep. What are so some of the those were, those were the days, and I was green, you know. Uh, I just learned, you know, about being talent buyer. And then, you know, pretty soon, you know, I was meeting bands and becoming a manager with bands and booking bands. And yeah. You know. Yeah, who, uh, okay, so uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but uh, after the Creekside, why are you doing all this? You had, who are some of your mentors growing up? Who did you look up to? Well, at the time, I didn't look up to anybody because no one was doing it. I had some friends from Philadelphia that were doing it, but yeah. I wasn't even doing it yet. This was just being the manager of a nightclub that was packed. And I got to be in charge of everyone and everyone was older than me. And I got to decide what would happen. And I had the casting couch, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At that age, you know? Yeah. Uh, people would have my back, like the bouncers. I mean, nothing could, have, I was golden at the time. And yeah. I didn't know that's what I was going to do. Yeah. Uh, Creekside Inn had some, had a fire, flood. Um, I was approached by the people that were then um doing the Creekside Inn. You know, the um the class one disco tent. Okay. And they asked me if I would come there and work and bring my following, you know. I guess being a nightclub manager, you you know, you build a following like okay. like, like if you were in a band. You yeah. Know? To be honest, they wanted to turn the night the disco into a straight bar because it was a gay club when it opened up. Yeah, yeah. So they hired me to, you know, bring the crowd in. Yeah. And it was around the time of John Travolta, so it was easy. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody was wearing bell bottoms and clogs. Okay, okay. So did they, did they buy when the I start, When I started to get into the band thing, I only knew of the big promoters, so. Okay. Um, Who were the big promoters at that time? Electric Factory Concerts. Um, the Caesar Angler from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Graham, yes, New York City, the yep. Fillmore East, you know, and, and then and San Francisco, San Francisco. San Francisco. Uh, independent promoters like a Cellar Door from DC, and Tom McCool was from Allentown. There was a, a guy named Stu Green from uh, Binghamton, and I got into the business working the production side. So. Um, the sound, the lights, the crew, the, you know, I tell you what, when we first started doing concerts, we would, I would have to call around to record stores to see how many records an artist was selling. Now mm -hmm. we just go online and, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, at that time, Metron wasn't there. And that's when I started getting the itch. You know, I can remember, um, the Pikers were the first band that I mm -hmm. was the manager of. Okay. And so I met who Sean was in the Pikers? Quinn. That was Sean Quinn and his brother Shay. Mm -hmm. And Kirk Hassinger was the drummer. Frank Schaffner was the keyboard player. Uh, oh, geez, I can't even remember. But that's um, the first time we ever heard of uh, Shay Quinn, Shay and Sean. Right. Well, that was when I first got started. And yeah. when you manage a band, it's a, it's a personal thing. It's a relationship with the individuals. You yeah. know, you never think you're going to do anything, but you, you take care of people and make sure I can remember we had a gig at the VIP and uh, the Pikers were booked, but they double booked it and the shark showed up from Lancaster. Okay. And we were both there at the same time to load in. And I, told my guys, get your stuff in the elevator. We're going up, we're going up. We started going up and the shark showed up and I said, oh, they double booked it, you guys are out. And they looked at me, oh, man. That was the first time I took care of my band. You know, a year or two later, I'd be taking Shay and putting him into the sharks and being okay. their manager and, you know. Okay, so that was your doing? That was? Pretty much. 
that's the case I never knew. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There are so many stories that the, the amount of people, what I'm calling, I, I refer, referring to as a connector, is that without people like that, or musicians wouldn't stand a chance. You need it's motion. Because, because you need motion, and you need supporters, and you need smart people that are not just musicians. Because musicians, well, now they call it a team. Yes. So every artist has a team. Yes. And it doesn't always, you know, back then a manager did everything. You know, they still should, but the manager was the agent. The manager was the business manager or the accountant, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time that I met the Sharks, uh, the Metron started to come. And just prior right. to that, I was at the Rumpelstiltskins. And I had left Harrisburg to go to Philadelphia, where I ran a discotheque nightclub in the Valley Ford shirt, and it's now Addison. But uh -huh. when I came back, I did Rumpelstiltskins for a while and was booking new wave bands, and I went out and find all the new wave bands. And then Metron opened. And okay. then, it, you know, then I met Kix. You know, yes. I went, I drove down to Maryland to see this band that I'd heard about. And, Met were, them they, were, they, were they kicks at the time? No, they were the shoes, but they were, yeah, they were becoming kicks. Yeah, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, you know, it's hazy. You know, we're getting into the 80s. <laughs> if you remember, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember uh, telling them I have get this nightclub up there. We got this radio station, and PPA Rocks. We're going to play your song and get you up here. and. You know, next thing you know, I'm their manager. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so how was that? Oh, that was crazy. Okay. Because here, well, so was the Sharks at that time because, you know, uh, Kicks signed with Atlantic Records. They had a seven album deal. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I was, a, you know, I mean, the real manager was in New York. It was Bud Prager, but he managed Bad Company, Foreigner, uh, you know. He was big, you know, so we went up with the band to meet him and had a great meeting. And as we locked, he put his arm around me and he goes, so you're in charge now. I have no idea what to do with little bands. I only know the big ones. Yeah, yeah. So he, you say he was, he was the big manager? Yes, when Kicks got signed to Atlantic Records. That was his doing or your doing? No, that wasn't his doing. That was a guy named Bob Ace, an insurance salesman from Baltimore, okay. who was the guy who housed Poison when they left her, when they left here to go to LA, yeah. Bob Ace. I guess Atlantic Records signed him, but they wanted a new manager. So they bought in this Bud Prager guy. So I think he gave Bob Ace five grand and sent him down the road. Bob mm -hmm. Ace took his money and moved to Los Angeles, you know. Okay. And then I was in charge. And basically what I did was book their gigs and make sure we got our money. They would always go down to Baltimore and have, that's where Steve got his band's name, Funny Money. Okay. <laughs> they got me so I could make sure the money wasn't funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then once, once, once he went down, yeah, yeah. But I was with Kicks for, you know, those early years. I uh, recorded the second, went to Miami with him. We recorded the second record, and you know, it was good times. Yeah, I could I could only imagine. They're like a. For those who don't know, they are legends in this area. Yeah, and then we couldn't we couldn't understand we couldn't understand. From Hagerstown. Yeah, we couldn't understand it. Like people from around the United States, they were from to me as big as Rat, or whatever you know whatever those big bands were. That first Kicks album is still classic. Yes, it is. There, there are still songs like half the album, they like forty years later. Yeah, and the problem, of course, was is that the second album, Atlantic, decided to take them in a different direction. They yeah. Brought in an English producer, who put keyboards in and all these yeah. different things. And had like Nick Gilder body, write body talk. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Hot child. The band, hate, the band hated it. Oh, of course. <laughs> Refuse to play half the songs. Yeah, as he should. And the keyboard was always behind the curtain with me going, bing, bing, bing. Oh, I, I didn't even know that. 
Yeah, in other words, I assumed it was just a a, a cassette tape. <laughs> we we weren't that advanced in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so tell tell me about the sharks. Well, the sharks um, played five nights a week, six nights a week, seven nights a week. We played every Monday night in Reading, Tuesdays. I mean, we developed a circuit. The sharks were making bank, you know. They were playing all the time and we built up a huge following. So we could, you know, put two or 300 people in a nightclub on Friday nights, you mm -hmm. know, Monday nights. And we were at the silo in Reading and the village in Lancaster and Metron. And we'd go to Delaware and to the beach bars. And the crazy thing was about their grassroots and the, the band themselves. In 1985, they had this MTV basement tapes contest mm -hmm. and they won. Yeah. You know? Crazy. Yeah, so I remember they got an electric recording deal and an EP and a video. Mm -hmm. and of course, you know, when you get something for nothing, that's exactly what it turns out to be. And yeah, of course, the record and the video, you know, never really went past there. But it was still exciting times for yeah. a while, you know, and it was big for a band from Lancaster, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, they, they were, um, they did it, they they did what everybody wanted to do. Again, they were like, kind of like the Lancaster version of a, they were huge. Yep. People were still, they still have a following. You know, it, and it, was that tug of, it was the tug of war because they became popular being a cover band, playing new wave dance hits. Yeah. But they would be sneaking their songs in and writing their songs and that's yeah. We knew we had to do. We had to write songs. Yeah. Make yep. songs. Yep. Okay. So now, uh, I became aware of you, probably. If I'm being honest, Big Tub of Mista. Yeah, that's later. Yeah. Well, only because I people talked about it. It's like it's like I, I was I was I played with some of those those guys, and uh, it's pretty. Um, so when you sign up like these days, now if you were to do it these days, and you don't do you do you support any bands anymore like that? Not, for money. Not for money. Yeah. Of course okay. I didn't then either. <laughs> okay. You know, the labor of love, you know. Okay. Okay. I mean, if they made a lot of money, I would get some, you know. Yeah. But so, it was more about making sure that they all could make this a career. Okay, so what did you see in Big Top of Mista that made you think I'm oh, gonna, once again, I'm gonna... That was a personal that was a personal relationship? Okay. Know? I met um, Bob Breckbill and Rick Gad when they were in a heavy metal band called Last Call, but that's not why I met them. I met them because they worked for McClure Plumbing and Heating, and I needed to put a sink in the farm show arena for Green Day. So I said, Hey, could you guys put a sink in here? You know, so we went and bought a sink and they put it in for me for this Green Day concert. And after, ever since then, we were friends. So when they told me they were going to put this swing band together, I said, oh, I'll help. That's wonderful. I was at that Green Day show. <laughs> <laughs> the Riverdales and Green Day. Nope. How about okay. that? Just remember the support act. Yeah. They trashed, they trashed the dressing room. And Eric Hoffman and I still have some of the carpets from there. As a matter of fact, I still have. I still have this. Hold on. Oh. Wow. What's a green day? It. It's it's being invisible. <laughs> oh, green day. Okay, cool. That is that is a so uh so very quickly what it what did what did big tub of mista what were they doing right? Why do you think they're successful? Well, it was, a, it was very quick. The, the perfect time for that. Um, there was a movie. What was the movie? Uh, I can't remember. With a derby. It was at the derby. Yeah, yeah. the movie with the band. At the, I mean, we went to LA. Martini yeah. Brothers got to go to LA. You yeah. Know? But just prior to all that stuff, we had the City Island concerts. And I knew that that predated the big tub of Mista and the uh, Martini Brothers, because that wasn't until the mid '90s, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the '90s. Mm -hmm. But all through the '80s, we had those City Island concerts. 
Yeah. Uh, we had everybody from the Grateful Dead, Motley Crue, Bob Dylan. So Dan you were you were the one you were the man responsible for booking all well, that. Well, that was McCool Productions, but that was one of my early, what they call collaborations. Now. Okay. I met this guy from Allentown when I was working Stabler Arena shows. Who was he hired me to run some of his shows? He was a promoter, but I did production too. So the sound, the lights, the crew, the backstage stuff. Yeah. I still do that on the side. I do all yeah. Harrisburg University and some Live Nation stuff at Hershey. But yeah. those days were the primitive days where, you know, we went to City Island, which was just a barren thing. We had to put up a stage and find power and put in toilets and, you know, there was nothing there. Yeah. And when we got kicked out of City Island because the mayor didn't want to lose votes because the noise was too loud and Wernley's bird was crying, we ended up going to different colleges and we even did Metallica over Wait, Grove. Grove Speedway. I was there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I forget. Was in the trenches. Plus I used to take real jobs, you know, to afford to be able to do so. Okay. The courtyard nightclub was after the Metron, you know. Okay. West Western, the old Villa Leo. Yeah. Okay. We did that for a bunch of years. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So, you, uh, so you're responsible for some of the. I was it Tom McCool, or is that Tom McCool was from Allentown McCool Productions. Okay. His base of operations was the Allentown Fairgrounds, mm -hmm. Stabler Arena. I was booking shows in Harrisburg, Lancaster, York, Reading, the Silo. I used to book all the big shows up at the Silo. He, I had a big act one night at the Silo. He came down and met me and asked me if I would work for him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing big shows. And that's when we, City Island. Yep. Okay. Okay, so now... Uh... Tell me about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Well, I got so many stories of shows on City Island, um, but when Stevie Ray Vaughan was, Vaughan was going to play there, I knew he was. I mean, you know, I had to do my homework, you know, so whether it was Loverboy or Huey Lewis in the news, I don't remember who he was on the bill with, but I knew that I was I had advanced the show over the phone. You know, back then we didn't have cell phones, you know? Mm. I, I mean, for me to have pictures from back then is a godsend. You yeah, know? yeah. Someone else probably had them and sent them to me, but I knew he was something. So I just parked my old ass right outside his bus till he came out. Mm -hmm. and I had a list of questions, a couple things for him to sign. Mm -hmm. Of course, because I was the promoter rep, his tour manager said, go talk to that guy. Give him five minutes. Yeah. That was the beginning of his career? Like, in that nationwide career? Well, it had to be. I mean, because his career only spanned eight years. So yeah. If he was three or four years in. Yeah. Was he, was he, was he sober? <laughs> well, it was in the morning. Oh, so well. I wasn't sure what was in the cup that he had in his hand, but I okay. assumed it was either orange juice or coffee. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, that gets you in trouble though, to be assumed. But I got the, but there was a lot of crazy stuff that went on City Island because back in that, back in those days, uh, independent promoters uh, ran the stuff. Now everything is Live Nation or AEG or, mm -hmm. you know, big production companies. You know, it, it's rare that there are independent promoters that aren't gobbled up in the major markets. But, mm -hmm. Back then it was crazy because it was the wild west because, you know. It's a kind of a whole new in industry like in the, in the 70s, coming up oh, in yeah. the 70s. Brand new kind of. 70s and 80s. Yeah. 80s was, yeah. I mean, it was the heyday, but it was also, you know, when promoters could literally steal money. Okay. You know? <laughs> huh? Now, now they count every bean, you know? Yeah. Back in the day, you know, concessions, merchandise, ticket sales, yeah, food, you know, 
And if a promoter was smart, he was getting some of some of everything, if not all of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I learned a lot. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine. Because you were there, you were in the trenches. Yes, I was. You, you saw it as it was. As, you saw the change as it was happening. Well, this so, also helped. This also helped in my management career because I knew what to expect or what I wanted my band to have when we went and played. You know, whether it was a you know a hospitality rider or mm -hmm. towels and water. You know. Yeah. I wanted to make sure my acts had that. You know? Yeah. So you, you were responsible for, were you responsible for poison as well? well? I don't know that I was responsible for them, but I'm sure that I was one of the first one to give them gigs. As uh, Paris? As the Spectres. Oh, as a Spectres, even, even prior to. Yeah, yeah, Ricky Rocket cut hair for Billy Campbell in Mechanicsburg. Yeah. Ricky was a hairdresser. Yeah. Uh, Brett was just an insane, but driven dude, you know? Yeah. Bobby Dahl, Sandra Dolphin, uh, and Smith, you know, the original mm -hmm. four guys, they opened for Kicks everywhere. Yeah. That's one of the reasons they left. They said, well, we're never going to be bigger than Kicks. So they moved to LA. Yeah. Took, took the Kicks show with them. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, of course. They added makeup. Added makeup. They, they did the balloons and the. Took everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, So, um, and then there's Hailstorm. Hailstorm met when they were in middle school. So their original band was with their parents and they would come to the Millennium Music Conference. Mm -hmm. And the first year, just dad came to check it out and see. And yeah. the next year, uh, mom and dad were in the band and they were basically a young Christian band. Okay. And when when I met them, they were from Bethel, PA, up by towards Reading. Yeah. Okay. So I remember them. They played in Manchester. These kids, dad was the bass player. Right. And uh, mom was a keyboard player. You were the keyboard player. No, mom. I was going to say, I thought you said I was the keyboard player. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, you had that kicks background. So it was a. Yeah. Well, I when I met them, they were just young and coming. And all I did for them was bring them to the music conference where they did it themselves. Yes. They met David Ivory. David Ivory <coughs> produced their initial stuff, got them the contacts. Yes. That's the way things happen. Well, that's what I'm saying. Movement. You you supplied movement. You helped them with the movement end of it. Networking. Yes. You know, networking. People. And I've yes. always been like that. Yeah. Say, if, I, if I can't help you, I probably know someone who can. Yes. That's wonderful. But that's it. But that said, there are more bands than a few that do not like me. All right. Because I don't give their band gigs, you know? Yes. And all I can tell them is I'm probably going to pass on soon, you know, mm -hmm. and someone else can give you a gig, but what if your band sucks? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, can, we can't take that risk. If I haven't heard from you, then it, then it, it doesn't, it, it well, doesn't make sense. I know a couple parents who think I ruined their kids' career because I didn't give them gigs, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. There's a lot of people that, I don't know, they think that there is no working your way up to things. That's, that's to be honest, why I started the music conference 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was saying, I could bring all these people together. You can learn for yourselves. Yes. Stop asking. Let's me. talk about the Millennium Music Conference for everybody who doesn't know what it's all about. Well, it started 25 years ago. Uh, at that time, um, I was running a hotel, the Best Last Inn in uh, New Cumberland, which used to be the Villa Leo. It had a conference center. I had been to other conferences, whether they were billboard conferences or new music seminar in New York. And in order to create a scene, people need to be educated to what it takes to be in the business or the industry. So we started it. At that time, Vicki Walls was in town. She became my partner in crime. And we worked together for that for three or four years mm -hmm. until the uh, Dewey Beach 
thing started up. Okay. Let's move down there. Okay. But it's a conference and a showcase. So a conference brings industry professionals to town and bands to town. They play everywhere during the day. They go to a conference. They learn about publishing and legal issues and, you know. So the whole thing is about, like, musicians. They learn their craft. They learn to songwrite. They work on their stage presence. They work on all this thing. But it's the music business. They're not going to get somewhere until they become more savvy at the business end of things. Until they treat their music like a business. Yes. I mean, it's it's. You know, it's a no brainer now. Uh -huh. We've already passed through that time when the record companies didn't have control on it and indie acts are bigger than ever and you don't need a record deal yeah. to do stuff nowadays. But yeah. every band, until they have a team, there's usually one or two people in that team that have got the business savvy. I'm not saying bass players or drummers have to do anything. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it's not funny because there's always one person in the band or two people in the band that are the leaders of the band okay and in my experience you know oh usually always a lead singer is but it's yeah. not always that way uh, when the sharks were a band doug was the boss of the band he was yeah. the drummer yeah uh, kicks was the band donnie was the boss he was the bass player yeah you know yeah, that's why none of the, the but usually a band will have one or two members of it that are the music business angle. And until the band can get big enough, they can't have an agent or a manager or an accountant, you know. So when you refer to team, what do you what is the what is that that what is that all, all depends what a what a band needs. Yes. I mean, let's look at a band that's trying to do something from our area. Take the small town titans. Wonderful band. You know, they got an agency deal before they got a record deal. They don't have a record deal. They're still independent, but they met an agent, Andrew Goodfriend, who actually came to do a keynote and got to meet them and see them mm -hmm. and stuff at the Millennium Music Conference. Well, now they're out on a tour and they go out on tours. And who are they opening? Do you know who they're opening for? Well, they're on different tours. They're, they're, you know, I can tell you they're going to get the Buck Cherry show in Harrisburg in November, okay. but you know, yeah, they yeah. don't even know that. Yet. I forget. Yeah, they don't. So I, so I'm the first to know this. Probably. <laughs> Outside of they're a wonderful, speech. wonderfully, uh, we, they're wonderful musicians. They're that, they're that you know, but they have an agency now. Yeah. And an agent gets them on other tours, so they can go out and get on tours. So they're going out and they'll do five or six dates, then they'll come home. Uh huh. But they're doing, they're touring. Yes. Which is what a band would do. They're literally living the dream. You know, it's no dream in a van, but yeah. You know, it's a, it's before you get a bus. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. What they, but the hope is that they build it and they build it and they build it and then hopefully it, it gets up to that. And someone who you have to have faith well, in someone that. Someone saw something in them who can affect their careers. Their rise. Right. Yes. Yes. So, uh, what are you doing now? I'm the talent buyer for, for XL Live. So mm -hmm. I book all of the acts that perform at the XL Live, mm -hmm. and um, I have to say it's the biggest and the best venue in this region. I agree. Um, I also work with Harrisburg University. Okay. I'm more of a production person there, so. Once again, the events, the stage, the sound, the lights, the crew, the backstage, you're producing the events for Harrisburg University. Mm -hmm. I very work very closely with Frank Schofield, who's their um, entertainment director and music industry guy at the university. And before he got there, I used to produce some the street events for Harrisburg University. Mm -hmm. I also do small things and I have relationships with a lot of the owners, but pretty much I'm exclusive XL Live now. Okay. So um, XL Live, for those who don't know, because I think, I think Harrisburg was missing that 
like the chameleon, like the Metron. Like when the Metron went down, they they kind of they kind of lost. They kind of lost. And, and, and there's a connection there because the owner of XL Live, Phil Dobson, who owns uh, Savannah's, and he's a real estate okay. developer, real estate. But um, his first business he owned was the car wash down the street from the Metron. And when the Metron was open, he was out of his car wash at night, parking people for $5. Okay. Little did I know he'd want to have a club like that someday. <laughs> but five years ago, he called me and he said, Harris, I'm doing this. You ready? <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes, it is. That's wonderful. So um, who's, who's coming up at, at, at XL? They're coming back. Concerts are being uh, reinitiated. Yeah, we, uh, it happened a little faster than we thought because to be honest, we had stopped making plans. You know, in March, when we closed, we thought we'd be back in a month. Then a month from that, we thought we'd be back in six months. And then, you know, we kept making plans. And, mm -hmm. and when it did finally start to come about, it was a little bit of a shock because we could open up at half capacity in April. And half capacity for XLI was 500 people. Yeah. You know, um, you know we're not always going to get 500 people, but we were shocked so we opened up slowly with local bands so most local bands worth their salt got an opportunity to play at xl live and they may not get that opportunity going forward mm -hmm. because to be honest fridays and saturdays through the rest of the year are already booked there yeah most of them are big touring acts and we can't announce them until we can announce them but yeah you so who every you can see every day there's an avalanche of shows by the time, I mean, already you can see what's going on at Hershey. Mm -hmm. How many uh, how many days a week is XL open? Well, right now we're just we do a lot of different events. Okay. We have we're usually Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Fridays and Saturdays are the big nights, of course. Um, Thursday nights are patio parties with the DJ, mm -hmm. and Wednesday night it's kind of like a private event. It's comedy shows. Okay. But we've been full. We've been full. Okay. And of course, we are a very clean new venue. We have garage doors, ventilation. Mm -hmm. But now it's full capacity already. Yeah. And we weren't ready. I mean, I booked for 50% capacity. That's why so many local acts got to play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, as I said, the connector, the connector that I'm I'm talking about, you are absolutely one of a very few people in this region that have had an effect on so many people's lives. I don't even know if you know. There's no way to tell how many people whose careers have been altered because of well, your. A lot of a lot of them are still my friends, and you know, I, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy because um, I actually didn't think that the Millennium Music Conference would go past two years. Okay. Years. I didn't, you know, I, I'm used to nothing lasting, you know? Yeah. But, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing it anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Did it, it happen? It, it stopped last year. Well, we did it virtual. Okay. You know, and, and June to the end of June would be about the time when we would start up again. And to be honest, it takes a chunk of my year yeah. and life that I'm not sure I'm willing to do anymore. I mean, it I was never that. about money, never made any money doing it. You yeah. know? I mean, don't quit your day job. I tell that to all musicians. Yeah, yeah. But um, I just, you know, I don't want to, I'm thinking in December and January, I might want to take a vacation. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I'll be thinking about, 25 venues and different sound companies and 300 mm. acts and, and and people flipping out because speakers and making laminates and making a cd you know it was fun no it wasn't fun it was work you know and i'm i'm not trying to do that anymore yeah, yeah. it's overrated <laughs> you know i have a couple of people interested in taking it on okay but 
it would take someone special, I think, to be able to navigate the local scene here. Absolutely. Which is something we didn't really touch on that I'm hoping we close out with. Okay, so let's talk about that. So who who are the next? So you kind of have to, I don't know, who are the next, who would it be the people that will replace you? Well, there's plenty of that, you know, I mean, but I'm talking about this scene we have here. It's okay. To me, it's it's still never happening the way we want it to happen. Okay. And now That's we're great. a bigger, now we're a bigger market than Lancaster. You know, okay. with the folding of the chameleon and XL Live and HMAC and Abbey Bar. But count them on a finger how many nightclubs are just concert venues where bands can go play that play original music. Yeah. Where where are the place for the bands to develop? I mean, it takes Agreed. a special entrepreneur or owner to want to open a venue, a place that does live music or has a stage where bands that are touring the country stop and play. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. You know, you go from small places that all do the, you know, the same bands over and over again that'll draw. Mm -hmm. Whether it's cover bands or tribute bands or party bands. Yeah. You know, but it's so hard for original bands to play. And then every venue that does open kind of has to find a niche to do the kind of stuff that they do. So only a certain type of band will play at Love Drafts. Certain mm -hmm. type of band will play at Abbey Bar, you know. Judd has a great stage, you know, at Federal Tap House. He won't use it, you know. Yeah. I mean, we have great places where bands could play, but they're restaurants. So yeah. although it'd be great to have a band play in the Evergreen Brewing Company, they could care less about a band. Uh huh. It's great to have acts on the deck at Flinchies, but those people, you know, I mean, it's not a venue venue. We need venues. Yeah, we agreed. We need places for bands to play, to come up, you know? Absolutely. It can't be fire halls and people's basements. You know, Second Street should have three or four nightclubs. Yeah. Not yeah. 25 DJs. Agreed. Yep. But I'm old. You can stick. No, on. no, no. This I'm is not the, trying this to is save. The... I'm not trying to save the world any. Yeah. I'm just trying to get out of it nicely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Rip off that band aid. Gracefully. So, uh, yeah. So the building the scene, this is a tricky scene. It is because, because we don't have enough connectors. For twenty no, but for twenty five years, I had this music conference, and if we had to depend upon local musicians. For that music conference, it wouldn't have lasted three years. Yeah. 75% of the acts and the people came from outside of 25 miles. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. You can lead a horse to water. Yep. And then they wonder why I won't hire their band. Yeah. Where, where did you play? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, there is no place to play, but you know. Yeah. So that's what that's the work that has to be done to build this scene. And I, I include York on that too, because York does not have an XL. Well, York will have some stuff, but there's a gap between, you know, a singer songwriter playing in the corner of a restaurant I, to a stage, even if it's a small a, a stage with 250, 200 capacity, mm -hmm. you need that kind of place for mm -hmm. bands to play. Yeah. I don't care if it's metal or hip hop or what. Yeah. Musicians need a place to play. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's throw this out. And yeah, I don't. Thank you, because that's 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 the uh, stuff I we all need to hear. I mean, it's also radio. There's no way a local band's going to get their song play on the radio. I mean, you you got a local radio show on Sunday nights. I don't even think the X has one anymore. Mm -hmm. The River might. I'm not even sure. Michael Anthony Smith, you know. Yeah. But TPA, I ran that one for three years. And that, that was my calling. I said, oh, I'm going to do TPA Sunday Showcase, you know. Okay. And they said, do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. But the whole, I mean, 
okay, we took a year off. So obviously all the places that might have been trying to do stuff got snuffed out or just barely stayed afloat and are coming back. But we need more live music venues. Yes. We need places where 200 capacity, 300 capacity, 500 capacity. So a band can build up to get to play at XL or the main room at HMAC. As mm -hmm. it is now, we've got to put eight local bands together to get enough people in these rooms. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And developing your list. That's one of the things that you, you said that uh, what a band can do if they want to do really good stuff is develop a fan base and uh, build a team. You know, whether it starts be with the team, local, yeah. starts in the center and works its way out. And yeah. You build and you build and you maybe meet other bands at conferences or stuff and you trade gigs with them. And, but yes. networking and meeting other people. I mean, you can be in your garage all your life, but you're never going to get gigs if you don't get out and play, you know? Mm -hmm. And don't be a jackass. Well, <laughs> that's, that's my project. I'm going to do, um, <laughs> who was it? So when I say that, when I say that is these people like bad mouthing other bands, like a jealous kind of teenager thing. It's like, like promoters bad mouthing each other. Listen, I'll be the first to agree that even though during the pandemic, we were all in this together. As soon as masks were off, we're not in this together anymore. Mm -hmm. It's every man for himself. Agents are gouging for more money than they were before. Ticket prices are going up like gas prices and grocery prices. Mm -hmm. You know, fifteen dollars an hour isn't even going to be enough soon. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to announce all our shows so people don't run out of money because there's so many shows out now. It's like an avalanche of live entertainment. Yes. Oh well. <laughs> like I said, I'm not trying to save the world anymore. Uh, no, no share your thoughts. Gracefully. Uh, no, all that this is all stuff that yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's my next blog or podcast. It's like mistakes musicians make because I've documented a lot. <laughs> Tell me some. Well, first of all, you know, it's like you're gonna put out a compilation CD and the bands are sending in their submissions, and you always got those bands that have eight and nine minute songs. How is that? getting played on the radio, let alone getting on a CD, mm -hmm. you know, or their, or their press kit that they send you doesn't have any dates on there. Believe me, a promoter is not going to check to see you played those dates. So if you're smart, put some fake ones in there. So it looks like you played somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. I got a million of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, stay away from drugs. Yeah, sometimes if it weren't for drugs, these bands would really be bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. No, it's not the 80s anymore. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, John, we're going to get going. Uh, thank you so much. And if there's anything else, I'm serious about this because you got, you got lots of stuff in your head that you see. I'm like a minion in your world <laughs> because I, I respect you. And well, like, you know, this should be an open conversation. <laughs> if there's anything I can do in my world to make it better. Open a nightclub. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, okay. You're going to hate yourself, but yeah, it's a labor of love. Yes. <laughs> All right. All righty. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. And bless you. And uh, yeah. And, uh, and Millennium Music Conference, no more. That's, uh, well, I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All righty. XL, thank XL you. in Harrisburg. John Harris, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I will see much. you later. Bye.